As the sea of tranquility fell away, an eagle ascending in an unreal quiet headed for lunar orbit, Armstrong noted that the flag he and Aldrin had taken so much care to place into the surface of the moon toppled into the dust. For the first time in flight, Mike Collins let himself believe they were going to pull this off. He had spent the past three and a half hours laboriously punching data into his computer, ready to take over if necessary. But his cookbook of emergency rendezvous procedures had gone completely unneeded. And there in the eyepiece of his sextant, Collins could see a small black dot, eagle climbing up from the craters so steadily that it seemed to be riding up to him upon rails. It was the happiest sight of the whole mission. Collins floated back to his couch. Through the rendezvous window, he could see Eagle slowly closing in, its thrusters spitting flame as Armstrong braked for the final approach. Even as he steered Columbia into position for the docking, Collins raced from one window to the other, taking Hasselblad pictures and movies. And as the last steps of the dance were played out, Collins suddenly called out, I've got Earth coming up behind you. It's, it's fantastic. Collins captured the sight on film. Eagle the moon, and the tiny blue and white world of Earth. He would always remember the moment. All of humanity captured in a single photograph, minus only himself, the photographer. Get ready for those million-dollar boxes, Armstrong yelled up the tunnel to Collins as he handled the two weightless containers snugly zipped into white cloth bags. He could feel the mass of the rocks within them, and he was careful not to move too quickly as he passed them through to Collins. When they were safely stowed in Columbia, he passed up a small white pouch and told Collins, if you want to have a look at what the moon looks like firsthand, you can open that up and look. Don't open the bag, though. Collins unzipped the pouch and saw a small Teflon bag filled with black... Suit? Armstrong laughed. You'd never have guessed, huh? What was that bag? Collins asked. Oh, that's the contingency sample, Armstrong said. Any rocks? Oh yes, there's rocks in it too. You can feel them, but you can't, you can't see them. They're covered with that, that graphite. And there was plenty of that graphite on their spacesuits. Armstrong thought that they looked like chimney sweeps. Before he and Aldrin could rejoin Collins, they tried to vacuum some of it off, not just to be tidy, but as part of the procedures to prevent quote-unquote, moon germs from reaching Earth. With no real vacuum cleaner, they had to use a brush attached to one of the limb's air hoses. As they had suspected, it turned out to be quite a vain attempt. Lunar grime had worked its way into the fabric. The suits would never be clean again. When the cleanup was done and all the unneeded gear was piled into the tiny cabin of Eagle, Armstrong and Aldrin exited to Columbia and closed the hatch. Eagle was now dead weight. Collins flipped a switch and the ascent stage drifted away. For his part, Collins was glad to get rid of the craft that had been nothing but a worry to him for six days. But in Armstrong and Aldrin, he noted a quiet sadness. Without a heat shield, there was no way to bring Eagle home. No museum would ever put it on display. 
It would linger in lunar orbit while Mission Control monitored each component's final hours of battery life. Long after it had become a dead ship, Eagle would spiral downward until it crashed, blasting a new, modest crater into the dust. After splashdown, Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins stepped out of the helicopter onto the lower deck of the carrier Hornet, looking like men from another world, outfitted from head to toe in gray-colored biological isolation garments. They peered through face masks clouded with perspiration and waved to a crowd of sailors and visiting dignitaries, whom they only saw dimly. Despite rubbery legs unaccustomed to Earth's gravity, they made their way quickly to the open door of the silvery quarantine trailer. A NASA doctor followed them and closed the thick window door behind them. Three and a half days later, they arrived in Houston, sealed within the trailer as if they themselves were lunar samples. For the next two weeks, they lived within the Lunar Receiving Laboratory, recounting all aspects of the flight in minute detail. Aldrin described the strange flashes he had seen on the way to and from the moon. No one had any explanation. But after a time, Aldrin noticed that Armstrong seemed annoyed whenever the subject came up. As the days passed, the men joked about being jailed, and at the close of one debriefing session, they called out to the engineers on the other side of the glass, you know where to find us. We're not going anywhere. In the off hours, there were movies like Goodbye, Columbus, and card games. Collins beat Armstrong repeatedly at Gin Rummy. They had company, including doctors, a NASA public affairs officer, and some unexpected arrivals. A few scientists who were accidentally exposed to lunar samples. And though the LRL wasn't a bad place, it had a bar and an exercise room, Time dragged on. At the end of one debriefing, when asked any other comments, Collins said quietly, I want out. That would come on a hot August night, when the men would be released into a world changed for at least a time by what they had done. Armstrong hoped that the first lunar landing would inspire people to believe that seemingly impossible problems could be solved. As for its impact on their own lives, neither Armstrong nor his crewmates could guess what lay ahead. Until now, they hadn't had time to think about it, but there would be months on the banquet circle, including a world tour, then each man would find his own way into a new life. For now, sitting in the LRL, Buzz Aldrin had time to ponder the significance of what he and his crewmates had been a part of. Back on the Hornet, they had watched videotapes of the news coverage of Apollo 11. There was Walter Cronkite exulting at the lunar touchdown. Then odd crowds gathered around TV sets, witnessing the first footsteps on another world. For the first time, Aldrin sensed the emotional impact of the first lunar landing. For a man attuned to irony, here was something worth pondering. While the three of them were a quarter of a million miles away, much of humanity had been spellbound by a midsummer miracle. What a moment that must have been. Aldrin turned to Armstrong and said, Neil, we missed the whole thing. 